How's it going? Andrew here and welcome back to the Creative Endeavor podcast. This is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I've got a real treat for you. I'm talking to Brian Mark Taylor, who's a fantastic artist based in Utah in the United States. Now, I've been following Brian for quite a while now, and I'm really intrigued by his work. He seems to have such a variety in his body of work. You know, we often hear this idea that artists have to specialize in one way or another, that if you're the seascape guy, or the landscape gal or the portrait dude, then just stick to that. That's your jam, that's the lane you gotta stick in. But when I look at an artist like Brian Mark Taylor, he does whatever he wants. He does some concept art that's absolutely fantastic. He does some landscape work, some on plein air work. This guy doesn't seem to be limited. He's only limited to what his imagination provides him in terms of inspiration. So I really have wanted to talk to Brian Mark Taylor for quite a while now, pick his brain about his creative process, but also while we're all going through this global situation, find out some of his strategies and what he's doing in the face of this and just how he's coping with the quarantine lockdown situation. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's Brian Mark Taylor in The Creative Endeavor. Brian, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Welcome to The Creative Endeavor. Well, thank you for having me. It's a great thing you're doing, and I think you've uh, shared so much with people, and it's an honor to be on it. Oh, awesome. Thanks for saying. <laughs> hey, look, why don't we just go ahead and kick things off and have you tell us about yourself and your work and maybe how you got started on your creative journey. Well, uh, like most artists, you know, you have that kind of itch as you're um, a, a child, right, to uh, create and draw, and and uh, that was the same for me uh, in grade school. You know, just this kind of fascination and interest with uh, first for me painting animals, and uh, I got into fantasy and monsters and things like that, or is what I was creating. But then I went into an art academy uh, at uh, let's see, fifth grade. And during that time, my eyes were kind of open to a lot of the other art movements that were going on. And uh, But one thing that was interesting, even at that young level, is I was starting to be pushed more towards uh, ex abstract expressionism and some of the modern types of art. And the teacher saw that I had talent, that I could draw really well, but she already wanted to curate me in a way that you know, I could be her protege or something like that. And it actually turned out to be, went from something really positive that I enjoyed. And, you know, I went twice a week after school and then it started, started to fall apart a little bit where I was feeling that, um, they wanted me to go in a direction that I just had no interest in. And it's interesting. I I've kind of had that experience throughout my career until I got into my master's program at the Academy of Art University where I found a school that was interested in teaching representational painting. And, and that's, you know, what I've always been interested in uh, since I was younger is that, you know, draw to nature, draw to, you know, things that actually exist and understand how nature works and stuff like that. And um, it, it took me, uh, it was a little, it was a real fight, you know, through my undergrad years and uh, through, you know, just the general public school programs and stuff like that until I could kind of just say, hey, look, I'm going to forget all this and just go off and do my own thing. And uh, really fortunate to find, you know, the Academy of Art University where they, you know, taught those kinds of things. And they're one of the only two or three schools in the U.S. at the time that were teaching the traditional stuff. Now we have a lot of ateliers and things in the U.S. And now we've got, you know, YouTube stars like yourself and others that are teaching things where you don't have to go to a, uh, um, you don't have to go to a university now and pay all that money. You know, I paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for my education in my master's program, right? Uh, I wouldn't do that again today. You know, things are different now. That's, that's kind of how I got my start. And I just uh, kind of shot out of the gate as far as uh, selling my work in, uh, you know, I did plain air, plain air festivals and things and won, won awards and stuff and 
traveled around, probably did a hundred of those shows, uh, which really helped get my name out there. Uh, but also picked up some galleries along the way there. So, uh, but all during that time, I've always also been an entrepreneur as, as well. I've always had an interest in it. It started when I was younger. I had a lawn carrying business and I got a kind of a taste for, uh, you know, having my own business. So I've never oh, ever left my destiny to any and to any other thing other than myself. It's always been something where I've, um, I'm still steering the ship. And uh, I think that's one of those things that has benefited me during maybe some tough times, like 2008 when you know, galleries and stuff were closing. Uh, I, w I still had kind of the, that entrepreneurial spirit to just keep moving forward and, and uh, keep working on things as, in, until the kind of market started correcting and then kind of go back into the galleries and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, so that... That's a little bit. I, I did minor in business actually in my undergraduate degree. Uh, so I, I, I guess I've always had that interest. You know, I'm a, I was a passionate follower of Steve Jobs and, you know, now Elon Musk and some of these other great uh, innovative thinkers. And I know you've had some interest in, in that kind of stuff too. Was, you know, I think artists in general have that love of, you know, making not just art, but making things. And so that's uh, something that, you know, I've definitely had a passion for as well, making your equipment that you use, you know, as well as the paintings that you're doing, right? Yeah, for sure. A lot of varied interests as well. I, uh, you know, I raise, uh, I raise fish. Uh, now we're going to be raising ducks and sheep and, and uh, I have an extensive garden. So we have all kinds of different tomatoes and varieties that we grow. Uh, so I'm a little bit of, I dabble oh, yes. in farming a little bit. <laughs> But I, I just think there's so much about life that's uh, that's that you can be interested in, and I think that feeds itself into, you know, your artwork, obviously. Yeah. So that just gives you maybe a little taste of my interests and and uh, things that I like to do. That's brilliant. And think about. Yeah, because I mean, you've had you've had such a varied career as well. Like looking at your um, your Instagram feed, like one can quickly get a, a sense of like how talented you are, but how you've actually used your talent and your brains and wits to be able to create like a, you know, not only a beautiful landscape or a painting, but then turn around and do some really incredible concept art and then turn around and make your own Peshad box line. You know, there's all kinds of incredible things you've been involved in. I, I want to ask you, actually, I was really curious because I'm a bit of a fan of concept art myself. What are some of the applications that you've had, you know, with that type of art? And what is it that you really love about, um, you know, creating some of these science fiction kind of landscape things? They're, they're incredible. Yeah, sure. They're simply incredible. Well, thank you. When, when I mentioned back in grade school, I was really interested in fantasy. Mm. Uh, fantasy literature, uh, it's kind of to some degree in the water here in Utah. We have some really top uh, authors. One of them is Brandon Sanderson, New York Times bestseller. Uh, but there are also, so there was this kind of this element of fantasy art as well. There's an artist named James Christensen. He recently passed away. Just a brilliant, brilliant artist. He definitely had an influence on me. Uh, he taught at the same school I went to with undergraduate. But when, uh, so I had that interest early on, but uh Something about just maturing that process of going to, I lived in Italy for a couple of years, and um, I think that turned me on more towards this 19th century naturalism and stuff, and so that's where I kind of went into that direction. Yeah. But uh, a couple couple years ago, I kind of, uh, maybe it's that midlife crisis, you know, I'm 42 now, and, uh, you know, wanting to get back to my childhood and the reason why I started art in the first place, and I think uh, a big part of that was, you know some of the movies like Star Wars and um, and and seeing the uh, you know the way that uh, you know Pixar of course you know following Steve Jobs and following Pixar mm -hmm. uh, I know the um, some of the the higher ups in in the Pixar uh, universe uh, inc including John Lasseter and they've they've had this kind of influence that I've never kind of left that love of the fantasy and science fiction. I'm more into science fiction than fantasy in part because, well, even today with the COVID-19, we are kind of in a dystopian reality right now. And I'll tell you what, I'm getting all kinds of inspiration 
with <laughs> what's actually going on here. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, science fiction and 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 uh, the, you know it's interesting. The science fiction writers of the '60s, some of their stuff has come true, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think some of the stuff that's being written today, written today, will come true uh, later. Not all of it, obviously, but you know, you look at Elon Musk and you see the giant rocket that is behind him while he's talking about going to Mars and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I felt that in a way. Um, there is kind of a reality and a truth there that we all identify with. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of neat to kind of look up at the stars and start to imagine, you know, really what that might look like. Mm -hmm. And so it's really started as a total passion. I haven't sold any of that artwork in galleries. Of course, I've had a lot of clients just come and buy it from NASA scientists to, you know, uh, the guys that are making the Avatar films. Uh, but you know, this uh, this stuff was really kind of, for me, kind of a way to just express that kind of inner child in a way that, uh, yeah. and that's why it doesn't have to have that polish that you see in other, uh, you know, concept art, uh, yeah. which I love. Some of the concept art out there is just absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, but I, I wanted to take it in a direction that, a lot, that really nobody's taking it in, and which is a more painterly, abstracted sort of direction. Mm. Uh, so, and, you know, I've, kind of found, found a little bit of a following with that uh, as well, which is which has been really fun. It's, it's awesome stuff because it kind of, it takes me back to those days of like um, uh, Peter Ellenshaw and, and creating like these uh, monumental matte paintings for movies, you know, the, the kind of away yes. from the concept art. They were more in the, in the production end of things, you know, creating those effects. But they were paintings and that was yeah. something that really inspired me as a kid and, and in particular with film and television is it you know the, even the concept right up the front you had to have a creative person or an artist that was the the visionary behind what this thing was going to look like you know they were reading the script they were talking yes. to the director and then they'd have to go away and and make it and there's something about that that I find really cool, but I, I do love where you've taken it with your work because again, it's got that painterly edge and um, I, it's unique. I haven't seen anything quite like it, you know. Um, interesting. Yeah, that that's, you say, that's what I get a lot of. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, a lot of people are like, "Wow, you are different. You are very different." Yeah. And part of it is be not having the pressure, maybe to sell it is is what I've said, but really, I that. The fact that I didn't, I'm not worried whether I've, I'm finding a market for it or not, mm -hmm. allows me to have that kind of freedom. I think sometimes finish and polish is because of what the market demands, mm -hmm. and to have kind of, I want a raw power to it, mm -hmm. and uh, and not being worried about, you know, a, a gallery or somebody trying to sell it, uh, just allows me to have that mm -hmm. energy to it, and. Uh, you know, I found some very serious uh, science fiction collectors buying the work because it's so it's so different, right? It's so unique in the. So anyway, it's been fun. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. It, it isn't it interesting. The minute that we attach something monetary to the work, it suddenly there's something about that 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 if we allow it to, it can leach the creativity out of the process. And as soon as you're just you like, can. no, I just want to do this for me, you know, to heck with it. I, I'm just going to do it. And then suddenly you end up finding right. your audience or like a brand new tan tangent audience off somewhere else. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, you, well, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, well, one thing you see too is that, um, you know, there's groups that love Star Wars and, mm. and, uh, you know, some of these major science fiction brands, mm -hmm. but there's also groups that want something more hardcore and serious and unique. And so, um, there's not a whole lot of people that are kind of fulfilling that sort of sort of demand, you know. And um, uh, anyway, there's it's just an interesting place that uh, I, I never would have expected to end up, but it, it's it's been fun. So, are people finding you through your social media mainly, or you know through yes. Instagram? So, is that how you're you'd be able to sell quite a few of these these uh, concept type works? Well, there's a, there's a show called Aluxcon, and that's mm -hmm. if you're into doing science fiction or fantasy traditional type art, mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely a place to go. And that was really, for me, uh, 
and I had no, I, I had never heard of it. And somebody said, Hey, you should, you should sign up for this. And, um, somebody out of the blue just said, Hey, you should do this. I heard somebody was, um, need like leave, uh, or how would I say their, their booth, they're not going to be using it and they want to sell it to somebody. And I thought of you and why don't you do it? So on a whim, I just like, okay, I'll do it. You know, it's, I'm on the West coast and it's back East and I hate shipping paintings, but anyway, shipped everything over there and, and I had a, had a sold out kind of exhibition. So, wow. you know, awesome. it was kind of a little bit of a, Hey, you know, this has, this has some legs, but one of the things I still don't want to do with it is start trying to monetize it or whatever. It still sure. needs to be for me or else it will change in a way that I, mm. I won't like. Yeah, I think so, so. still keeping that raw creative edge to it. Yeah. 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 So you were saying something about, um, uh, I want to want to ask you about this and pick your brain. So uh, something about the, the current world pandemic COVID-19 and drawing some inspiration from that. Um, how <laughs> I, I, I want to, you know, cause it's interesting, you know, there, there's, it, there's a lot of people right now that are, are really, you know, hurting in the face of this crisis, you know, the, the disease aside, um, the economic fallout from this, it's going to affect everybody. So, you know, you're, you're drawing a particular, um, some creative inspiration from it. Um, I, I find that really interesting T tell me about that. Well, I think, you know, art always comes from a place of, uh, at least for me, it's of, you know, fear, sadness, being anxious. And even if I'm painting something that's peaceful, like today, I, I've been working on a waterfall. And the reason why I'm working on something peaceful is to kind of like, have a Zen moment, kind of get away from all this craziness. For sure. And so I do feel like um, this kind of crisis will create more of that raw art that has that kind of inspiration and power that typical, you know, yawn, lazy day, you know, watch Netflix while you're painting kind of a day and into, oh my gosh, I got to, you know, create something here that has, you know, power and meaning to it. You know, so for, for let me give you just one example. This is not necessarily directly related to science fiction, but it's related to kind of what we're dealing with right now. And that is, uh, last year, April fifteenth, the uh, you know Cathedral of Notre Dame burned, yeah. and I just remember watching it kind of in horror on television. You know, I have a strong connection to Europe. Uh, like I said, I lived there in Italy and been to France many times. And um, uh, you know, watching it, I I just sat down while I was watching it and and did a very fast painting mm -hmm. of it. And I feel like you know, in just in a half hour, and it you know, just putting it up there is just kind of displaying my grief along with everybody else's yeah. became kind of this uh, powerful moment. And so, and, and there's various reactions. Some people hated it and accused me for trying to monetize off of it, uh, even though I didn't post it for sale or anything like yeah. that. But, you know, people have different reactions to it. Sure. But sure. I'm just glad people reacted to it, whether positive or negative. It was something that, you know, we can kind of share our feelings, right? Yeah. And so I think this is also a moment where we are going to have so much commonality, like even though you and I have never met, mm -hmm. we now are going through an experience together we and we can relate on that level, right? Mm -hmm. We can relate to that fear. We can relate to the, uh, the concern. Yeah. And um, I think in, in our mind, whether it's uh, evolution or what, we all whether you're a, a believer in a religion or you're not, you still have this fear of the end of days, you know, the, the Armageddon sure. kind of sure. kind of thing. And so that is a major theme in art. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something where, um, you know, you can choose to run away from it or try and totally escape from it. And maybe today I was doing a little bit of that as I was mm -hmm. painting the waterfall. But at the same time, I was uh, last night while I was watching some, stuff with my kids i'm i'm you know painting this giant uh city that's you know on fire and you know all these oh, wow, dude. <laughs> uh, all this pandemonium is going on <laughs> you know oh, so wow. uh anyway that it, it's uh it's i i just want to kind of explore the whole range of the human condition right i don't want to just you know be the 
you know, the happy, peaceful kind of painter because the market demands it. I, you know, I have all these other emotions too that I need to express. Uh, there was some, some of the most incredible work that's ever been done, just artistically speaking, you know, uh, has been done in the face of, of crisis, major revolutions, wars, you know, civil unrest. Uh, again, I was talking to the podcast about this with somebody else. Um, Francisco Goya, in some of his work yes um and i still you know that that the, i'll never forget that that image of like the it was an etching of the fire and i actually it was a painting as well the firing squad where you just see the people lined up like this and the guns are going off yeah and like he was living yeah. through that time and it was some dark times man and but the work is so powerful and now we have that to kind of yeah. look back and i think it it really does art has the power in that in that circumstance to really shape a cultural narrative. Um, you know, we're doing it all the time. Now it happens to be more with with uh, film and television, but I wonder what form painting will take. And, you know, people yeah. can say that. People can say, okay, well, yeah, you're profiting or, or you're, you're taking advantage in, in a parasitic way off of off of something that's happening, some something that we're all going through. But I think these people that say that sort of thing forget what the role of the artist is. And that is just a comment or just to actually represent something and, 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 and cause people to look at it through another way. And it's interesting the way we yeah. access meaning through a painting rather than just looking at it on a screen or looking at it in real life. When you're looking at an artwork of something, suddenly it takes on a whole different meaning or a whole new level. Absolutely. To it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, even and you've you've noticed this too. Is as I'm out on location painting plain air, mm. people will come up and they'll look at the scene you're painting. Uh, and sometimes I'll be painting maybe a small detail. And I say I would have never noticed that in, unless you painted that, you know, or mm. I would have never thought to paint that. Mm. And maybe that says something about my taste as an artist. But uh, you know, a lot of people are like, "Wow, I would have never in a million years painted that. Why didn't you paint this instead?" But you know. What the artist does is really draws attention to almost just like an arrow pointing to, hey, this is what you should be paying attention to. Not all of this out over here. Yeah. And I think we have that that kind of responsibility as, you know, as everybody's bustling around in their cubicles or going to work or school or whatever. Uh, an artist has this ability to kind of see what is going on mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. uh, society and put your finger on something that everybody's feeling and, and thinking, but really not able to kind of quantify. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so let's say, let's say you're, you're an observant young creative and you're just about to step out the door and launch yourself in this art career. And, and this happens. What, what are you thinking? What are you, what are some of the, some of the things or strategies that you would offer to somebody who is just, I'm really putting you on the spot here. Sorry, Brian, but uh, yeah. let's say, let's say you, uh, you were in that position and you're starting to think, well, gee, you know, here's my opportunity and now it's gone. How do we, how do we maintain or, and, and, and keep hope and, and enthusiasm in the face of these things? Well, uh, one of the things that, helped me uh, like in 2008, for instance, because I was, um, you know, I graduated with my master's degree in 2005. Mm -hmm. So three, three years out of the gate, just, you know, kind of getting established and started and 2008 hit and I was just super, you know, worried about it. And I remember talking to a guy and he said, well, you know, I've been through seven or eight of these. And, wow. and, and just hear, hearing that, you know, like, yeah, I've, I've been through all of these and you know, there was a rough time here and we had to do this and a rough time there. I mean, that's that's one thing you should count on as a creative person or in any field is just count on stuff like this happening. It's going to happen. Right. So the question is, how do we prepare for that? Now, in a moment like this, it's a little tough to prepare because it's happened if we haven't already prepared for it. Right. Yeah. Uh, but one thing we do need to think about is. We do, as a, you know, kind of air, use an airplane analogy, we need to lose weight. So uh, we need to be really light right now, meaning uh, if we have any sorts of responsibilities, they're eating our time, whether it's, you know, the care of 
you know, and, and I've just said I've added on animals to my life right now. It's not <laughs> a good time to add animals or any sorts of extra care type things mm-hmm. in your life right now. This is a time you have to be even more focused, right? Yes. Um, so you have to get those things out of your life. I would remove um, Netflix and any of the television stuff, stop watching it. And a big part of it is really kind of getting to work here. So this is an opportunity which we have to stack up inventory for a time when the market will come back and then we have an opportunity to sell our work. Mm -hmm. And so we always talk about, I know artists are always saying, I'm behind. And an artist will always be behind. It's just just the the life of a creative person because they're always trying to perfect everything they do, Yeah. right? But this is a chance that we can... Um, and I've seen a lot of people trying to sell things online and put things at discounts and stuff like that. Um, maybe that's working. My feeling is probably not so much. This is a time just, you know, focus on getting better, creating uh, some better, higher work. So when things come back up, mm-hmm. then you can be okay. Now, if that means you have to go and get uh, a job of some sort, you know, working at Home Depot or whatever it takes, you know. You have to do that, right? But instead of coming home exhausted and watching Netflix, you go home and you paint. You go yes. home and you do your digital artwork. You yes. you uh, level up. Yeah. Uh, and so, this is these are times that will define certain artists and break others, mm-hmm. right? There were artists that uh, were you know friends of mine that were broken in 2008 and didn't come back to it. Uh, so is this one of those times like, you know, being forged in the fire, is it going to make your steel stronger or is it going to, to break you? And so, you know, taking those steps necessary to really, uh, you know, I, I sat down with my wife as soon as we knew things were going South, um, you know, check my stock portfolio to make sure, you know, oh, I'm, I'm positioning myself well, but yep. that's a whole nother subject on, on ways of, uh, in like recommends that I would have as an artist to invest like the safest ways possible. I'd You're already taking enough risk. <laughs> You're already taking enough risk on yeah. the other parts of your life. Yeah. Don't do that on your, on your finances. But, uh, so for, for one practice, I absolutely recommend even in these times is that it doesn't matter how much you make. You always at least have to save 10% a year, no matter what. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you have to go without shoes, you should be saving 10% of your annual income a year, no matter what, and putting it somewhere. Um, and that practice has, is one of the biggest things that is, that will help me and my family, you know, weather this storm is that just that simple thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and when you put, you, you take it out first, you don't take it out at the end of the month. You take it out right at the beginning, like it never happened. Yes. Uh, and anyway, that's, one little simple practice that I would recommend uh, any creative person to do because you just never know in a creative field, you know, what will happen from year to year, right? That's absolutely uh, right. And yeah. so uh, anyway, a couple little tips there. Um, hopefully that's that's kind of helpful to, uh, you know, these young creatives starting out and just wherever you might be at. Mm. Um, and that means, you know, if you have any sorts of habits that, cause you to regularly have to buy something day after day, you know, think about trying to get off those things, Mm. Uh, whether it's caffeine or, you know, whatever it is, right? Absolutely. Because that's money, you know, there's, um, and even as an artist, it's funny, I have this kind of this purity part, right? Art is pure and, you know, keeping it pure and that raw power that we were talking about earlier. But I also am not an idiot in the sense that you have to make money in order to, to live and survive. And so we can't be stupid on the business side of things. And a lot of artists, quite frankly, aren't as smart as they could be on some of that stuff. Right. And so, um, you know, some of these basic principles that, you know, I'm talking about really need to be, uh, thought out, uh, or addressed so that, you know, we can keep on, you know, keep on creating right without a, without a problem. I so appreciate what you're saying. I, I really do. And and I want to echo what you're saying about, you know, look, just about 2008. That wiped me out. Absolutely. But I didn't feel the effects until years later. We were insulated by the little economic bubble that Western Australia had going on with a really healthy resource sector. So the people that kept commissioning works for me, 
uh, still had their jobs in mining. And so this was all upper and middle mm. management. And then it started to slowly erode. And but there were other factors that happened where, you know, there was a change in legislation that meant that people could no longer buy artwork with their retirement fund. They literally signed a law and overnight I lost half. Of oh, my really? It was amazing. And I, I didn't realize oh. at the time how many of those people were actually just buying work because they could cash in their retirement fund and invest in art. The government had took one look at that after this had been going on for a little while. Went, Hang on a second. Let's let's go ahead and uh, and put an end to <laughs> yeah. this uh, for whatever reason. What it did though is it actually in one one swoop it it put hundreds of artists out of business, but also hundreds of galleries all around the country just started shutting down. Mm-hmm. Um, then the other thing that happened, which was again, these are things that are outside of our control. But China stopped right. buying iron ore. There was a little bit of a downturn into how much of this raw iron ore that they were buying so they could process it into steel and then sell it back to the Australians and everybody else. But they just stopped buying all these shipments of iron ore. So production went down. All the mining companies started going, well, crap, what are we going to do now? They fired virtually everybody, went back down to a skeleton crew of just working on you know, what they could fulfill. And those people that got the sack were all of my clients. <laughs> so now, oh my you know, goodness, so yeah. it's like this one, two, three punch. And uh, it, it totally wiped me out. But I can say from experience, looking back now, as painful as that was, um, would I go through it again? Absolutely in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Because that taught me uh, even more of a valuable lesson. There's something about these challenging times that, you know, as you're saying, this is the time where your steel gets forged with fire. And it made mm-hmm. me so much more resilient as a result. And the only reason that you and I are talking and, and, and anybody knew about me through YouTube or anything, or I've had this opportunity to talk to amazing artists like yourself and reach out to people all around the world. It, it, the only way that was possible is because I had to step outside of what I thought was my little bubble and create a brand new yeah. one. And would I have done yeah. that? Uh, you know, had that not have happened? No, I would still be painting pictures and no one would ever know. <laughs> you yeah, know? That's so right. That's right. I, I guess, you know, I, I really would like to encourage people too. you know, again, just echoing what you're saying. This is a time where we should be getting creative and just creating yeah. more and more and more. And, and again, turn off the damn TV. Yeah. Well, so let me give you just a little example that, uh, when I was doing all these plein air events and things. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, working really hustling through the 2008s and stuff. And I signed up for so many and was painting really as many works as I physically could do. And what happened through all of this is that my uh, arm started to get inflamed. Oh, wow. Like I was getting this major tel- tel- tennis elbow that was going all the way down into my, my uh, arm. And so I had to Start, I'm left-handed and I was you know, having to do some right-handed painting because I had wow. so much pain. So yeah, during that time, I was um, thinking that I was looking, I was making my own Peshad box, right? Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, because I didn't want to get into another a business necessarily. Uh, mm. I, I like making things, making stuff for myself, but not necessarily as another business. But that was one of the things that was the catalyst because I was like, I physically can't paint anymore. What happens if this gets worse and, you know, it's like a, a career ending thing. You know, I know it happens to violinists. It happens to, you know, professionals that use those little micro muscles, uh, even, you know, concept artists with the clicking mouse, you know, they'll get tendonitis that goes all the way up their arm from their mm-hmm. clicking, you know? Uh, but anyway, uh, it was, it was because of that catalyst that, that launched me into, you know, producing this uh, brand of Strata easels, right? Mm. And that Brilliant wouldn't product. have happened, I don't think. Well, thank you. It, it wouldn't have happened if it didn't, uh, you know, if everything was a little rosy, basically, right? I don't think I would have taken those chances and things like that um, if if I was just sailing along painting. So I think there are those, these moments really can, necessity breeds creativity is, is something that I've always uh, subscribe to you know, that idea. And, um, you know, I have some ancestry that they were kicked out of a certain part of America and they're forced to come here to Utah. And there was all kinds of necessity that was developed out of that awful, horrific experience. Right. 
And what it made is it made these people as tough as nails, you know? And so that kind of attitude has kind of been passed on even to this, you know, to my generation. Can I add something so, to that? Can I just add a little sure. something to that? Uh, tough as nails, yeah. but also some of the friendliest people I've ever met are from Utah. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, really? I, yeah, yeah. I remember. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. That's where I started my, I did a big U.S. tour with my father uh, back in 2009. It was, it was a fantastic trip. We drove all around the U.S. We started in Utah. We flew into Salt Lake City. And oh, wow. um, it, it was it was amazing. Like our first stop was Bryce Canyon and then Zion National Park. Man, come on. Fantastic oh, landscape. But when we're stuff. in Salt Lake City, yeah. we were going from like a store to store, Walmart, and then all these thrift stores just buying like old camping equipment. Um, and we had oh, complete sure. strangers just help us out and just show us from one place. And then somebody ended up basically saying, oh, no, this isn't a good store. Let me take you to the good one, you know? And so, there, <laughs> you know, I just, I found that there were so many people like that in Utah, though, that were just really, really friendly people. Anyway, sorry, off on a tangent, yeah. continue. No, that's good. Well, that, you, you bring up another good point, too, is mm -hmm. that I think the other thing that's important for a creative person right now in this day and age is to be if you're not part of a group of some, some sort of artistic group or mm -hmm. have kind of a, you know, a group of people that you can uh, talk ideas and stuff with, I think that's an important thing right now. Uh, yeah. I've, I've made phone calls to, you know, 20 or 30 different artists in the last week oh, wow. just to see how they're doing, how their life is. Uh, awesome. You know, I'm concerned, you know, I want to know how long they can say they couldn't sell one of my big questions is, is if you can't, uh, if you couldn't sell another painting for the next uh, year, you know, how long could you last financially? Mm -hmm. Just so I can, I mean, I know that's a little bit intrusive, but in the same way, if, if they know it's done with, you know, love and concern, I think it's, hopefully it's okay. Yeah, but I just yeah. want to see where they're at, you mm -hmm. know, and see if there's something we can do to kind of help each other. Because I don't see this as a, just a me, just a me alone fight. This is a, you know, all artists are struggling. All artists are going to feel this. You know, I just talked to uh, this morning at like 5.30 in the morning texting uh, a friend of mine who's one of the top gallery owners in Western art and, uh, you know, just wanted to see how things were going with him. And, uh, you know, he wanted to see how things were going with me. And we're just kind of checking on that so that we can, if there's any good information or something, we can pass that on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I got a phone call, uh, or I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, Hey, check out this, what the government's doing here. You might be able to benefit. Mm -hmm. And so I believe I benefited today just from that one little phone call. So, oh, I mean, really? it's coming back to me as well. So I think that, um, this is a time to kind of expand your network. Don't necessarily hunker down into your own. Mm -hmm. It's not your only problem. This is a time where, whether it's your family or, and we have, I have a large extended family. And so, you know, every Sunday we get together on Zoom and we're all talking and just seeing how everybody's doing. You know, that, that helps uh, create a little bit more solidity in your, you know, I, that, that makes it so it's easier to function and, uh, and to work and be creative. Mm. So I know we're talking about kind of all that other stuff, but I think right now that's what everybody's this, thinking about. Matt, you know? look, this is, it does this affect, is important. It this affects your important. art. Yeah, it does. It does. You know, none of us chose this. This is the world that we suddenly woke up and now it's, it's a brand new world. And we need to be able to um, navigate that world and keep our wits about us and not lose our heads in, in the process. Yeah. But I love what you said there um, about that, because, that, again, that's the biggest lesson that I learned back in 08. Um, or and for me, probably I should say it was more like uh, 12, 13, 2012, 2013, by the time it really started to hit. And when the chickens mm -hmm. really came home to roost and I was like, yeah. oh, now it's now it's, it's gotten real. Uh, but yeah. that that question is so important. If you didn't sell another painting, how long you got? And I remember my yeah. my father always, you know, equated money in the bank or, or savings to oxygen in the tank. You know, yeah. you're, you're going diving. How, how long are you going to last? So, yeah. 
Yeah, it, it's it's important. I mean, it's a sobering thought, but it is it is so vitally important now. And I think that what it is going to do for a lot of artists now is that if they hadn't learned this lesson before, they've got it now, and and now yeah. it's it's time to prepare. So maybe they can uh, kind of do a bit of online research at the moment and find out what kind of schemes are are happening in the country that where they're at. Uh, and what they could take advantage of right now. I know there, there's some of that going on in the U.S. Here in New Zealand, um, they've offered uh, certain stimulus packages and certain benefits that you can apply for if you are struggling in business. And, and I think they knew that this was going to affect a lot of people. And so governments naturally have made some preparations. I'm, and I'm not saying this in a way that I'm a fan of government, far from it. But I, the, right, the, right. they've they've made these preparations because they knew that people would be out of work and unemployed or something. So find out what is available and what you can take advantage of. But I think yeah, absolutely. the biggest resource, the thing that I think people overlook the most, uh, it's not it, it's not really money. Uh, I think the thing we overlook the most yeah. is time. Yeah. You know, of all the millionaires and billionaires that I've met, and I've met a bunch now, um, and I've had the fortune of, of doing some really extravagant artists and residencies and being around some pretty high up and influential people. And I can say they would, have, mm -hmm. they would trade their billions and millions in a heartbeat and all the luxury and all the comfort and all of that for youth and for time. If they could just yeah, go absolutely. back and do it again, they would just, they would give it up like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really in the silver lining, the great gift we've been given right now is that we're not wasting our time. So we're, we're stuck at home, mm -hmm. which is what an artist needs to be doing anyway. Yeah. And yeah. so this is, this is a chance that we have to really make the most of it. And, um, and you know, what are we doing with it? Right. So one of the things that I've also done to kind of reach out to, you know, everything's going online now, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think artists have this opportunity. You see a lot of online teaching and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've been working with uh, uh, another guy on uh, our Sentient Academy, which is an online teaching platform. And we've also shared some of our stuff, our resources with public art school teachers around the world. Mm -hmm. So we have hundreds of artists that are using our content for free to help... Uh, uh, students and kids teach. So I think this is an opportunity to, um, you know, share some of those resources. I know you do with, with, you've been very generous with your YouTube uh, channel and people can watch that content and, mm -hmm. and share it with their, their students and things like that. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of resources that are out there if we're willing to kind of use, use, utilize what's out there. So whether you're learning or you're wanting to teach, I think there's a big thing there's an opportunity here that we have a lot more people looking at uh, the, um, you know, take, you know, learning online and, and also uh, teaching online, I guess, is, is what I would say about that. And this is where maybe a lot of artists, if they can't sell right now, it's an opportunity to, uh, to interact with people that, you know, in a kind of a new way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there, there are so many I can't believe it took me so long to get to to embrace the the internet and everything that it could could offer us as artists. But there are so many things that are available to us now, and and this is why I've said there's there's never been a better time to be an artist. But I think right now, that is especially true because what else are you gonna do? <laughs> you know, you're stuck yeah, inside. It's true. Draw a picture and start yeah. start getting something together. Um, I was having a conversation with my father. And um, so, you know, we went through it in, in the early uh, 2010s and, and 2008 for yourself. And my father went through it in the late 80s. And he went a period of time uh, for about 18 mm -hmm. months where he didn't make a sale. And he was squirreling the money away, just trying to save and save, save. And people are like, you crazy, man. What, what are you doing this all for? And he's like, well, there, the, the storm is coming. Get ready for it. And he didn't know what or when or how. But he just knew that that mm -hmm. things happen with amazing frequency and he better be prepared. He told me yeah. it was really fascinating. He told me, um, you know, within that 18 months that I sold nothing while everybody else was sitting on their hands and not actually doing anything. 
by the time the economy came back and the shows started to open and the galleries started to, to get into operating again, some disappeared, some new ones started up. He said, I had a brand new collection of work. I was ready to go. Yeah. And this time I was even better. I was like, wow, man, yeah. like that, that was just so, I mean, again, the time and just pouring it into your practice. And um, I think that's wonderful, yeah. though, what you're doing with schools and reaching out to students and teachers and sharing that content. I, I think there's so much opportunity that it's important for people not to overlook the, the free aspect. Yes, we need to be you know, business minded about it, but it's, it's amazing what I've found through just offering things for free. What's come back as a result of that? Yes. So often yeah. things that you can't really measure. Absolutely. Well, it's the same thing as you you know, call up your friend to see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Then when you're in a rough time, they're going to call you up and see how you're doing. Yeah. And so if you, that's the, that's the genius of, of realizing you're part of a community or, and also engaging in that. Cause I know artists, some artists will tend to say, you know, it's just all, it's, I just want to be left alone. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to have anything to do with anybody. I just want to make my paintings. Yeah. And that can work in certain circumstances just fine. But in times like this, this is where you kind of will reap uh, maybe the things you don't really want to, you're going to just not have the experience that you want to have in, in times like this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just being open and, uh, you know, engaging in the community can really help. And I've seen, you know, other other people and do the same thing, being generous with whatever. And it's, it's really great to see that kind of stuff. Hmm. And... So what happens, I think, when when things come back up, you just have that, better connections, relationships. Uh, you know, there's there's a professionalism there. There's a leadership quality that you have, you know, when you do things like that. And uh, others that just hunker down and stuff like that miss that kind of opportunity, I think. Mm. So let's say you're, you're stuck inside, you're working on some things in the studio, you've turned off Netflix, you're not listening to the news, You've cut the TV and news media out of your life. What are you listening to to fuel your your creativity and, and inspire you and motivate you? Have you got anything that's on a playlist there? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, mostly I'm listening to either past historic uh, scientific breakthroughs or technological breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in innovation So of all types. I think it's inherently very positive. Uh, and so that's kind of the stuff that I, that I go to. Um, awesome. it's, you know, that, that, I mean, read, go read Elon Musk's biography. It's awesome. You okay. know, that kind of thing. <laughs> It'll just ins it fire you up, it's inspire you. You know, I mean, there's a guy, if you think you have a lot on your plate, imagine running a rocket company and I know he's, he's got his flaws, right? Just like everybody else, yeah. but we all do, right? Yeah. But you know, imagine you know launching a, a electric car company and a rocket company at the same time, and oh, not, not I guarantee to I have tunneling I should... under Los Angeles. <laughs> well, of course, uh, and you know, there's other things that he's doing. Neuralink. Yeah. Um, it's a you know, and uh, a bunch of other projects that he's working on as well, solar and all that. Mm. So you know, this is. And I guarantee you, he's going to have a couple inventions and new things that are going to come because of this crisis. You know, uh, even the whole thing with climate change, it's been something that it's been on our on our minds. And I know as a landscape painter, it, it's on my mind a lot as you travel around and see, you know, challenges and issues and stuff related to that. Um, in one way, this, I think, will help us awaken to the fact of, you know, that those issues uh, are still with us there that we need to deal with and there's opportunities and innovation that's going to fundamentally change the way we do things because of those challenges that will be faced because of that right. so that's another area that we can put our minds to and to think about so when I think about those kinds of things uh, I that becomes kind of energizing and charging instead of you know looking at the you know, the stuff that's happening to us, mm -hmm. you know, you look at these scientists, these innovators and, and how they like, oh, this is a problem. I'm going to solve this problem. You kind of, you, you kind of switch hats from be, being the spectator to you're in the game and you're kind of moving forward. So that's what I'm, um, you know, I've, I felt at least in the last couple of weeks, I've been, I've been, you know, 
got out of my lethargy into and in getting kicked into gear hmm. and some new ideas and stuff were kind of flowing. It's, it's really interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I hope I'm getting this word right. There's, there's a phenomenon when um, they're observing cells in a lab and they're applying forces and pressure and stress to cells uh, the process is called perturbation, I think, if, if I'm remembering that mm -hmm. right. But through that process, the cell adapts and changes and does something different in response to it. And it seems like the, the key ingredient there, because otherwise it would just sit in the Petri dish and, and wouldn't do anything. The key ingredient right. there is the stress. It's, it's that, yes. that, that external force that is causing you to move. And I think, that, yes. you know, as you're saying, it, and for me, this is what it's going to mean for me as well. Um, I, I was already working at a pretty decent clip, but now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now looking at efficiency and my effectiveness and I'm revisiting my business plan and I'm starting to go, okay, I, I felt I was doing okay before, and I, I had a habit of doing this, you know, patting myself, way to go there, kid, you know. <laughs> sure. I, I would oscillate yeah, between, right. you know, this pride, but then also beating myself up. It was never this kind of middle ground with me. It's one extreme or the other. But now it's <laughs> sure. causing me to go, you know what, I, I have got to put in more. It's now going to take even more. So um, it would be interesting to see where the stress goes. Okay, Brian. So, so all of this uh, doom and gloom of the the current world that we're in, which hopefully people can now see as an opportunity rather than a crisis. Um, you know, mm -hmm. despite the severity of the situation, we could use this time right now. Uh, what's now new for you? What is next? What's on the easel, for instance? I, I'm seeing this incredible painting behind you, but I'm only seeing a piece of it. What are What are you working <laughs> on now? And what kind of direction are you moving in next? Well, I do have um, several large private uh, commissions uh, that I'm working on. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about them. Uh, so sure. no worries. that's not going to be super helpful for the podcast. But um, so, and as, you know, in addition to that, a lot of things that I've been working on have related to travel, world travel. Part of it is to understand, get a better understanding of what's going on in the world, how things are changing you know, the economies or like we mentioned, uh, you know, just stuff that stuff that's happening. Uh, technology is changing things a lot as well. And uh, I know here in the Western United States, a lot of these old farms are being kind of bulldozed or just let to crumble because everything now is more GPS driven or, you know, they put computer chips in cows and, you know, they the cow steps into the stall and you know, it knows immediately how much feed to give this cow and how long it's going to be milked and all that stuff. You know, everything's changed in that sense. And some of this stuff that is that we have, you know, that is nostalgic is it's not going to be around much longer. And so I do feel a little bit of a, a desire to you know capture some of those things, knowing that they aren't going to be around as as long. So this. Uh, one of the kind of this theme that I've been building over the years is called vanishing landscapes and just things that have that are changing drastically due to a lot of pressures. So I know you've had um, um, Cesar Santos uh, on, I think it was your first podcast uh, in this series and uh, you know, him talking about Cuba a little bit. Well, when Cuba opened, I went down there immediately and I wanted to see for myself kind of what it looked like before things started changing uh, because I know the U.S. would have an impact once they opened it up for people to go down and see it. Well, U.S. has kind of closed their doors a little bit on it, so it may not. It may be uh, in the refrigerator a little bit longer before you know those changes take place. But uh, there are areas like that, or you know, I've been to China four or five times in the last couple of years, and that is where you're seeing just this massive, rapid change. You know, skyscrapers going up everywhere, super ultra modern cities that are making cities in the U.S. look like they're a little bit backward and, and quaint, you know. Uh, so just seeing those changes, too. And so going and recording some of that has been really interesting. Then I just went to India this last fall uh, because there's an area also that's kind of poised for a lot of change. Um, so I think 
you know, observing those kinds of things that are going on is, I, I feel like it's a little bit of a calling. It's also uh, in part my love of other cultures. And um, it's not, I don't want to just say it's novelty that's that's driving me and driving all of this or, but it, it's um, a, a better thing is just that desire to be a global citizen and to make friends and understand people across the planet because I don't, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about this. Uh, I could get political here and I'm trying, trying not to, cause I, I don't think it's helpful at all, but uh, I think it's helpful to just understand people better, you know, not create those barriers. And obviously it's going to get a little cute here, you know, but I think, uh, you know, art can really do that is it can transcend those kind of, political differences and things like that. And we can just focus on some things that are universally positive. And I think beauty is one of those things that has uh, this ability to transcend um, uh, the beauty of every, of each culture um, can really transcend some of these uh, things where we're, uh, you know, creating barriers and walls and, and stuff like that. So uh, I, I, I think that's a kind of a message that I can feel like, not only am I painting something and I love painting, I'm learning from it, but also I can feel like I'm doing something positive in the world. Like I'm leaving the world better than when I found it, when I'm doing that kind of thing. So, um, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the main area that I'm, I'm really focusing on right now. And uh, some of these big projects I'm doing kind of, you know, in a way relate to that is creating something beautiful, uh, a, a space that can be, uh, a meditative space, a sacred space, or, uh, you know, a place where you can, uh, go and kind of get out of the world a little bit and, and enjoy some, enjoy something that's beautiful. Right. Of course we can do that when we're, uh, out in nature. Cause you and I, you know, landscape painters and stuff like that, but there are people in some cultures that are, that the population is, is really high and they don't have that opportunity to go and, escape to these places as much. Um, especially some of these people with the COVID-19 shutdown, I was talking to some friends in Italy and all they have is a balcony to go off of to, that's their, that's the only nature they can go out to. They're in lockdown. They're in a little apartment and their balcony is the only outdoors they can really do other than run and go get some food once a week and come back. You know, it's kind of rough. It's brutal right now. So that's why I've been posting some of these nature scenes. And I know, you know, it's inspiring. You kind of, I mean, it's always better to be out in nature yourself, but if you can't be, you know, to have a big painting that has that kind of feel to it, I think really can inspire you and take you there or at least evoke some of those memories that you have. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why landscape painting has always had, you know, for hundreds of years, it had this kind of place in, in the art world, even with the modern movements and stuff like that still landscape painting is such a big, um, it's a, it's a big part of, uh, of being human. I mean, enjoying it or even landscape photography and stuff like that. Just look how many posts of landscape photography are on Instagram, you know, just millions upon millions of photos and same thing with, you know, a lot of landscape painters and stuff like that. So there's no better time right now. If you can, if you're not in lockdown, you can actually go out into nature and you're close to it. I'm very fortunate. I do have a you know big canyon right next to me that I can go in the Wasatch Mountains here to uh, kind of escape a little bit. But if not, uh, the next best thing is to you know get online and just put on a nice uh, scene of, of of nature right in front of you while you're painting, or instead of like I said, the Netflix or whatever, because that's that's oftentimes movie in Hollywood wants to put on the ugliness of humanity, you know, the the crime scenes and the you know, stuff that, you know, everything's falling apart or whatever, instead of focusing on these beautiful, positive things. Uh, if you're on Netflix, I highly recommend doing more of the planet Earth kind of stuff. You know, David Attenborough and, you know, his calming, soothing voice as he's describing these natural things going on. I think that's something that's very worth, very worthwhile, uh, you know, during a time like this. And and so if we if we kind of shift that focus, we can just draw a lot of, lot more energy from it than kind of the reverse, right? And listening to the news, you know, how many deaths were happening today and all that kind of stuff that's going on. Yeah, it's wise. It's very wise advice there. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, Brian, this has been a real treat talking to you. Um, before before we wrap this up, um, let's go ahead and just let people know because I've got one of your little Strata boxes. It's a great Pajad box. Oh, sure. Let people know about that and maybe where they might be able to find one. Are they still able to get one during all of this commotion? Yes, fortunately, um, we have, you know, manufacturing has been a, a huge challenge in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, and, you know, right now things are, are difficult. Uh, but we do fortunately have, because uh, we make them locally here in Utah. So, um, Basically, the Strata easel is a it's a series of uh, Pashad boxes, and we also have uh, like the one I have behind me here, which is more of the French easel style mm -hmm. as well, and a, kind of a vertical palette. And that's what I use here in the studio. But we have all these plain air boxes, and the the thinking behind it is simply a box that's indestructible. So a lot of boxes are made out of wood. And if they do tip over in the wind, which invariably they will at some point, uh, I wanted to have something that was uh, bulletproof that could fall over and still be okay. And so that's the the idea behind it. Also, by making it metal like that, everything can nest inside it. You know, it's a thinner profile, so everything kind of nests inside and uh, kind of keep it all nice and tidy that way. But uh, it's been something that has been very, very popular. People have used them all over the world, and it's it's very gratifying to see that. We also try and support each of the artists. We sponsor challenges where they can paint uh, every day for 30 days. And you know, we generated, I think it was uh, 20, 30,000 paintings in our last challenge. Oh, wow. And a lot of people were able to sell their work uh, because of it. So uh, we have a Facebook group called Strata Painting and Drawing from Life, and it's just an opportunity to encourage people to paint and share it with each other. And during this uh, challenge, you know, I've challenged people during the lockdown to uh, to do another challenge, uh, meaning paint every day and post it on the this group site. So uh, if people are feeling disconnected, um, this is my way of just trying to get people connected that are you know, in, into the kind of the same stuff and, and to paint and to share and to have these moments. And I know that people have kind of said, you know, I was super depressed today. And then I, I just forced myself to go out and paint and I, and I'm, you know, I'm just feeling so much better. And, and it's just great to see moments like that, you know, that people are just pushing, pushing through those challenging times. So mm -hmm. that's kind of something that I, I want to do is not just, uh, you know, the painting myself, but I want to help other people, be able to paint, be able to learn to do it and to uh, grow, you know. So I've tried to, you know, help them with the equipment, help them with the online lessons and all those things that I can do, everything that I can do to just help people enjoy that kind of same experience that I'm enjoying. And um, I think it's funner with more people and, and uh, you know, as we're kind of doing this and working together, we can, we can just make the world a little bit better place, hopefully. Awesome, Brian. Awesome. Well, on that note, I've had an absolute blast talking with you today. Thank you so much for being on The Creative Endeavor. Well, likewise, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to talk with you. I appreciate your insights as well. Well, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of The Creative Endeavor podcast and a huge thank you to Brian Mark Taylor for joining me. If you want to find some of Brian's fantastic work, then find him on Instagram and his website. Those links are down below. Also, check out Brian's line of easels, the Strata easel. I've got one of these that I've used down here in the South Island. I absolutely love it. So that link is down below as well. Now, as always, if you enjoyed this, click the like button for me, leave me a comment down below. And if you wanna come back for more and catch more of the Creative Endeavor podcast, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Also, you'll be the first to catch my sketching series as well as my painting tutorials by clicking that notification bell so you're notified when I upload another video. Very important to click that bell. Now, as always, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thank you so much for stopping by. It's been a pleasure having your company today and I'll see you again very soon.